But this is what happens. So Jesus goes about other, re other places in the region. The Bible says he was teaching in kind of a circuit, going around to the different cities. In Mark's gospel next, he sends the 12 out to preach ahead of him. Sends them out in twos, right? Why do you think Jesus went around the region preaching and then sent the 12 out to preach in pairs of two? What do you think his objective is? To see if, to see if his initial certainly Took hold. Took hold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. I think. I certainly think that's part of it. Absolutely. He he wants them to go out and kind of let's see what happens. Go out and engage. You know. But but do you see how relentless his strategy is? He went about preaching. We have a we have an inability to believe. I'm going to continue to go out right and preach in this area and do the works that your faith will allow me to do. Right. Then I'm going to send the 12 out. I'm going to send them out in tubes and they're going to go out preaching, right? And, and the Bible says that he gave them power, right? Mm -hmm. He called the 12, this is verse 7 in chapter 6 of Mark. He called the 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there until you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from them, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to them, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Jesus sends them out and says, I'm going to impart to you some of my power. It will be irrefutable. You will have power over unclean spirits. Don't move around. Go to a place and set up a, a base. It's more effective than, than kind of scattershot running through a region. And, but stay there, right? That's going to be ground zero. Wherever you land, stay there and work the works that I've empowered you to do. If they won't receive you, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them because there's nothing wrong with the sower there's nothing wrong with the seed so they come back and they give Jesus the report and Jesus then says to them listen you're going to we're going to have to get away you're tired you're beat you're going to have to get away in the midst of all this, the gospel writers tell us that John the Baptist has been murdered. Herod hears of what's going on, looking at uh, verse 14. Now King Herod heard of him, had heard of Jesus, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him, him being Jesus. Okay. And then the gospel writer goes on to tell you what happened with John the Baptist. You remember... There was a whole issue with Herod and Herodias and the daughter, and John the Baptist ends up beheaded, right? So verse 30 of chapter 6, the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. This is really Jesus' ministry at a peak. You know, peak in terms of popularity, peak in terms of, of interest, and you know, people are, are absolutely demanding their time and resources. And Jesus says, we gotta get away. Okay? So, next slide. Let's look at what happens. In verse 32 of chapter 6. The Bible says, so they departed to a deserted place in a boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion on them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. 
So he began to teach them many things. And when the day was far spent, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat, right? And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread? 200 denarii would have been about eight or nine months worth of salary. And give them something to eat. But Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, John tells us they found it in the hands of a little boy, they had five barley loaves and two fish. And he commanded them to make all the people sit down in groups of 50, the gospel writers tell us. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. Then they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the, of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men, not including women and children. All right, so there is the miracle. And that, again, is the miracle of that, that, is, that is captured by all four of the gospel writers. Now, let's turn ahead. Let's put a pen in that. And let's turn ahead to the gospel of John. And let's look at what happens in the aftermath. John chapter 6. Let's look at the crowd reaction. I'm kind of deliberately telling this out of order. But let's look at what the crowd reaction was. John chapter 6, verse 22. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which the, his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone, However, the other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people, therefore, saw that Jesus was not there for his disciples, they also got into boats and came to the turn of seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food with, which spoils, but work for the food that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on them. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. So he feeds 5,000 people, 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, which means he fed significantly more than 5,000. They want to make him king. They want to make him king. <clears throat> and Jesus points out, you know, you're following me because I gave you a sandwich. You're in this. You're excited about me because I gave you a sandwich. Because you're, you're, you're thrilled about the miracle. You're not following me for that spiritual truth, right, that can only take hold in your heart. You're following me because of your fleshly need. You want to eat. You want, you, and, and eating is always kind of emblematic, if you will, of wealth. Okay? I want to suggest to you that the crowd's reaction for Jesus is another one of Satan's temptations. Remember when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness? And I, I, I refer to Luke's account, Luke chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus is in the, in the wilderness, hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days, 40 nights. Satan says, hey, if you're the son of God, what? Turn these stones into bread. Get yourself something to eat, right? Take care of that flesh, immediate gratification, right? Mm -hmm. You can be your own genie. <laughs> Turn it into bread. Jesus gives him the word. Man shall not live by bread alone. Satan then says, listen, takes him up on the pinnacle, right? And says, hey, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from this roof, right? Because, and then Satan points out, because after all, the Bible says, he will give his angels charge over you. So Jesus says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, right? Yeah. Understand that when Satan took Jesus up on the pinnacle of, of the temple, that there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people below. So if Jesus had a 
consented to perform such a spectacle, everybody would have seen it. And they would have followed him because of the magic of the miracle. Satan is trying to get Jesus to be a king or become a king his way. Let the people react to what they see rather than what they believe. Does that make sense? So often in this life, we want to react to what we see rather than what our heart tells us. And that gets us in trouble because the eyes lie. And the eyes sometimes cause us to focus more on the creation and the circumstances than they do on the Lord that made the creation and is greater than any set of circumstances. Does that make sense? So what I want to suggest to you is this is Satan coming at Jesus another way because Luke's account says that finally after the third temptation when Satan basically showed him the kingdoms of the world and said, you can have all of this if you just worship me. Satan just cut to the chase. Listen, you ain't got to do nothing but bow right now. You can have it. Luke says when Jesus sent Satan away, that Satan went away until a, more, until a more opportune time that he might tempt Jesus. And there's a great foreign movie, it's an old film, and I can't, I can't call the name of it, I apologize, but it's powerful, it's an Italian film, so it's, you know, it's, it's not even done in English, it's like from the 50s and the 60s, but it shows the temptation, and then basically the movie goes through the life of Christ, and everywhere Christ goes, the devil is somewhere in the crowd. Mm. And that is how he does, and that is how he did. So now here we have Jesus meeting a need. He didn't do this miracle or any miracle just to be showing out. The Lord responded out of the goodness of his essence. He looked upon them with compassion. He understood they will starve out here if I don't feed them. He is also doing this so that he can show these people who are Jews, I'm the same God that fed you in the wilderness. I fed you in the Old Testament with bread from heaven. I'm going to feed you in this wilderness with bread from my hands. Make sense? And as the Bible says that Jesus took it, and when you look at the, the phraseology in the original language, the Bible says he just kept multiplying in his kingdom. Just kept breaking and you know, blessing and just kept breaking, kept multiplying. This is a up close, personal object lesson for these Jews. The same God that fed you before is the same God that's feeding you now, and they missed it because just like Israel of old, they wanted a king more than they wanted a God. Remember the Old Testament. God was their king. They said, no, 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 give us an earthly king. Give us Saul. Remember that? They wanted an earthly king. They wanted, uh, they wanted their Messiah to be a political hero that was going to restore uh, Israel to the glory days, to his former glory, all right? So I want to suggest that this is another temptation. If Jesus allows these people to offer this groundswell of, of emotion and, and support and make him a king, if they just get caught up in this mob action, there's a couple practical problems. One is he becomes a king without a cross. What do I mean by that? That's not what he came to do. What did he come to do? This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John the Baptist said when he introduced him, right? Mm -hmm. He cannot have a kingdom without a cross. Mm 